So here's our plan to go on the offensive. One of the things we're doing is we're sending teams right now back to Washington and we're getting ready to bring a big conference out. That conference will probably take place in the late um, summer, early fall. We may actually be talking to Todd to see if he wants to host part of it here. But what it is, is we're bringing an NRA and a CRPA team that will come out here and teach those that want to learn how to be more politically active, what to say, when to say it, where to say it. Historically, we've asked you to call on the phones. And for those of you who are good at it and like to do that, that's fine. But here's the thing that unnerves politicians more than anything else. You showing up, not necessarily in Sacramento, but in their local offices. Because here's why, generally speaking, if I'm a politician, I'm an assemblyman or senator, my A team is where? In the Capitol. My B team is in my field office. When you show up with the B team going, I don't like this, I don't want this voted, the B team panics. They start jamming the phones in the Capitol for you. So first, you get a twofer, because now you jam both of the offices. And it forces the member, because now the member has to force a new issue. Do I go home to a bunch of angry constituents or do I stay in Sacramento? But if I stay in Sacramento and I don't spend enough time at home, I could get bounced out of the Assembly or Senate because there's rules on that. And so that's where we need people. So you don't have to drive to Sacramento. We're not asking for that. But if we can get a few of you on key days when we put alerts out to show up at your local assemblyman, senator for the state or congressman's office, that would be a, a bonus. Next is networking with other organizations. We have to think beyond ourselves. For example, one of the ways that we just crushed a bad bill that would have negatively impacted hunting is we teamed up with the farmers. They, we had a joint vested interest. And by making our sizes bigger, we were able to convince enough senators, enough assembly people, don't want the gun people and the ag people and the 4-H people and the F yeah, no, this isn't looking good and they just kill it in appropriations. I'm good with that. A dead bill is a dead bill, no matter how we have to make it happen. The other thing is we're doing voices in regulatory matters. Here's one of the things that we sometimes, and we being the NRA and the CRPA, sometimes separately, sometimes together, have complaints about. And it's like, well, I don't see you guys winning any victories. So I will give an example of a victory that we just had and I'll let you be the judge if I should broadcast it on Facebook, social media, cow guns, et cetera, or if I should keep my mouth shut and keep doing my job. So 29 days ago, Sarah, who's back there, got to sit in a meeting with us where the Boy Scouts of America National Office was involved looking at closing every Boy Scout camp in the state of California's shooting sports program forever as a result of Gunmageddon and Prop 63 loss. At issue was there were some firearm registration issues because anybody, how many of you are, are former helpers with Boy Scouts or former Boy Scouts? Okay, 25 years as a Scoutmaster. How does this work? Usually some parents are excited about the, the shooting sports program. So they would get some 22s or shotguns registered to them. Then they would go out with the boys and later on when we had a venturing program, the girls teach them how to shoot. Their kids age out. Generally speaking, most adults hang out for another three to five years, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, there's other things to go do, and they leave. Well, some of those firearms didn't leave. They stayed with the new adults because there was a time period when units and the char organizations could own firearms. Can't do that anymore in California. So what we had was we had one such group that had literally um, four digits worth of firearms that had not been drossed over the last 40 years properly. And their idea was to go down to the local police station and turn them all in. How many of you think that would be a great idea? <laughs> so we talked to them and said, don't do it. Brought in an amazing legal team, FFLs, everything, got it taken care of. We are trying to get CCWs back for hunters. Because call me crazy, but there are some people when I'm out bow hunting that don't like me because I'm bow hunting. And some of the crazies have guns. I would like to be able to carry my CCW with me to protect me. Plus, for some dumb reason, we think big cats called mountain lions should have free reign to kill us and we shouldn't be able to defend ourselves. And then there's those bears too that sometimes aren't the best of moods. 
Not saying I would stop the bear necessarily with you know my 45, but hopefully I would make him think twice before continuing to charge at me. We couldn't carry him. It wasn't allowed. Working through the regulatory process, now this year it looks like fishing game is going to finally approve for big game. They approved for waterfowl and for upland game, and now they're looking at big game because nothing bad's happened of allowing it. Again, if we grandstand on that, what do you think the legislature would have done? Oh, no, 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 no. And we would have had a new law to fight. Okay? So hopefully everybody's understanding that. Part of it, too, is local grassroots recruitment. No matter how many people the NRA and the CRPA put jointly on the ground, I don't know all of you. I mean, Todd and I are going to know each other. So if Todd tells me, hey, this family up here, they're really trustworthy, I like them, I know them, that helps me realize. But otherwise, how... And I'm, I'm hoping none of you are, but how would I know an anti in this room from Kings County from a pro 2A person just on face value? So that's part of what we're looking for by doing this is we need the good people like you in this room to be able to look and go, no, 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 yeah, 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 this person, because you know those people. But we've got to build out and start spreading out. So this is going to hopefully help all of you. How many of you have ever been curious? There's friends of NRA. There's NRA training, there's NRA ILA, there's Wayne LaPierre, there's the CRPA. How does, who talks to who? How does this all work? I'm going to try in about 10 minutes or less, help you all figure this out. So over there, all the way to the left, is the NRA, the 501C4. That is Wayne LaPierre, okay? On legal paperwork. That's not what he looks like in real life. But that's what it looks like on legal paperwork. Okay, and that's the EVP, the executive vice president. And under that is Isla. So that would be to your right. And Isla is where Chris Cox, that you guys probably all get stuff from, that's where he's at. And then general operations. General operations think training, law enforcement, hunting, um, the museum, things of that nature. Okay, so does everybody kind of get how that works? The foundation is where the friends of NRA are. They're the ones that give out the state and region grants and the money. Okay? So both the NRA, but that's the foundation, and that's the regular part of it. And then you have the PAC, which stands alone. I know it sounds weird, but it has very strong ties to Island. Okay? So that's how they work. Here's the structure of NRA in California. So from the executive vice president, there's what's called the special projects group, which is Ed Worley, the former state lobbyist before Dan Reed, Paul Payne, his assistant Dave Halbrook, and their grassroots members councils, which are unique to California. So they have members councils in different parts of the state, and they do some of the grassroots efforts. Then when you come over to Isla, you have Dan Reed, your state lobbyist. He does all the lobbying at the elections and state and local level. So if you ever have a question for what are we doing as the NRA on Bill X, Dan Reed is the person you go to. Okay? And then, also under Isla, you have the Michelle and Associates Law Firm. Chuck Michelle is our president. He's also been our lawyer because we've co-used this law firm for a while. And under there, you guys should be able to um, to have this in one of your notes, but they do the litigation, regulation watch on DOJ, regulation watch with the Fish and Wildlife, local ordinances, range protection, FFL, publications, webinars, and legislative analysis. Two of those have watch on them. One is Department of Fish and Wildlife, one's DOJ. So I'm going to dispel some rumors. Some of the rumors I hear both for the NRA and CRPA is Wow, you guys like hunters more than you do us because you guys always have stuff from Fish and Wildlife and nothing from DOJ. <coughs> Fish and Wildlife has about 410 wardens, about 125 biologists, and all their people meet with us quarterly. And it's actually somewhat amicable. We get things done. DOJ has changed who's in charge of it three times in the last year, and they don't meet with us. In fact, they cringe when any of our lawyers, myself, any of the executive vice president's special projects team show up, they literally develop wings and run down the office away from us. 
So it's a very different relationship. So if somebody back here has a hunting issue, it's very easy for me to pick up the phone and actually talk to Chief Best, usually within about three hours. I have had phone calls to DOJ, emails, certified letters, and court orders that have taken longer than a month to get an answer. And that's after a superior court has said, you need to answer them tomorrow. And it's a month later. Okay? So it's not that we're not trying, but I need people at this level to understand we're just as frustrated. For example, CCWs is one of my favorite examples of one of the things that we're suing the DOJ on. But here, here's what's really interesting. I can use myself as the test case. I'm a former paramedic. During my last year, had to go get live scanned. Okay, had to do it every year. So I figured, well, I'm getting live scanned for this because my license had to carry on just over the last six months when I started my retirement. I get live scanned for my CCW. Put my hand down, scanner goes by once, ink, twice, ink. They both transmit together. Todd's seen this process. There's no magic whistles. 36 hours later, there's a knock at my door from FedEx. Here's your new paramedic license. Life scan passed. Wow. I should call the sheriff's department tomorrow because I should have my life scan back for my CCW five and a half months later. Question, why? Because on the medical side, there's over 70 people checking those life scans. On our side, two. That's why it's backed up. That's one of the things we're suing on because that's part of the delay. They have the money because you guys all pay for it. They're just not spending it. And so that's one of the lawsuits we have, okay? Here's the structure of us, the CRPA. So over to the left is the 501C4. So think of like Wayne LaPierre's office only. In this case, this is what we're running. So programs have things like training, hunting, youth, grassroots, volunteers, lobbying. And the administration has the membership, finance, marketing, social media, what you would call the normal nuts and bolts. Then we have our foundation where we put out the grants for our vets, law enforcement, ranges, training programs, etc. And then we come over to our PAC, which is part of why I'm here to talk about, that does the grassroots coordination, local candidate issues, watches, campaigns to combat the anti-2A movement. If you haven't noticed, the CRPA has been working over the past four years to really change the way we do business in this state. We went from no youth camps to we have now 74 camps that we co-sponsor and work with for our youth throughout the state. We were also pioneered as a program example, one of the things Working with the department, we found was kids were going to hunter ed, but they weren't converting to hunters. And that's bad, because down the road, that means the hunting numbers keep going down. So we asked ourselves why. Access was one issue, and there was a second issue. Baby boomers became the first generation in California not to teach their kids how to do a lot of things, hunting being one of them. They just didn't pass it on. Some of us, like me, picked up from our grandfather. But in cases where grandfathers had either passed or lived across the country or some other kind of barrier to teaching, it just didn't happen. So what we did was we went to the department, it took about two years to work this out, but we said, what if we bring a group of 30 kids, boys and girls, who have never fired a firearm, together on a Friday night, process them through on Saturday, both basic shotgun training and their hunter ed. Sunday morning, wake them up really early. See the smile? It's fun waking kids up early on a Sunday morning. Get them out. Teach them by having the dogs show up, get a light breakfast. They go out and hunt. Not only do they hunt shucker and pheasant, but they have to bring them back in, clean them. And then we had a game chef teach them how to cook them, and they consumed them. So when they left the camp, they were a licensed, successful hunter that had brought food in from the field and served it to their families. Retention went up from 4.5% for people that just took the class to 71% of those kids from the two different camps we tested at went hunting the next year. The reason we say that happened is because we didn't just introduce them, we changed them and took them over. And now we're using grant monies both from the NRA and from us to replicate programs like that from everything from Women in the Outdoors where it goes one step beyond and adds archery to the traditional women on target to other types of programs. So our political action committee, 
Like we said before, focus mostly on Prop 63, but now what we're going to focus on issues. So why the strategies? Politicians are going to cut their teeth at a local level. That's where they're trying to make their name. And politicians are really, really slick. One of the things that I have to deal with a lot of times is politicians will run for a specific office in a specific district for the only reason of I can sit in that office for two years and have no record that can be used against me. Think about that for a moment. You pay them with your tax dollars, and they either abstain, they no show, they literally do the math of how many means they can miss and just show up so they have nothing negative. What we're trying to do is get to those politicians before with the questionnaire. Fill this out. Because then, if they don't show up for something that has to do with votes, and believe me, water boards sometimes vote on 2A issues of where lines get drawn, of where guns can be carried. So if we know that, and we're watching for them, and they don't vote the right way, then when they think they're gonna be funny and run for your local assembly seat or Senate, we can send the alert out, no, because remember when, and then you know not to vote. Because how many of you actually go research judges on the local level? That's hard to do. Yeah, it's very hard to do. That's one of the things we're starting to try to change in different areas. It's gonna take us a couple election cycles to get statewide, but in areas where we have major issues, is where we're focusing first and then branching out. <clears throat> Here's the litigation. So all of you got that little packet in front of you? So basically, here's what happens. Uh, Peruta is currently up now that <coughs> Judge Gorsuch is there. That was pushed. We were having that in the holding status because we want that to go forward. Peruta uh, will work very, very good with us as far as setting things up with national reciprocity. So that one is going forward. We have Bauer, which is just up, the, up north in Fresno. For those of you who know Herb Bauer shooting sports, Barry Bauer up there is the plaintiff in that case. That's going well. Um, most of these right now are either at the Ninth Circuit or being bounced up towards the Supreme Court. We were waiting until we had a judge because before Gorsuch got on there, how it was working was several of our pro judges were looking going too dicey. We don't want this to go the wrong way. And so they were pushing it back. And once it gets pushed back, it's basically dead at that level for us. So it wasn't we didn't want to push. We were praying for this moment. It's happened, so now we can start to push because things are in the right balance. So those are kind of the litigation issues. I'm not going to go through every one of them. If you have questions, we'll go back to it. Uh, <clears throat> these are the ones right now, the SCOTUS ones, are the ones in front of the Supreme Court. And you have to look at some of these cases have California interests. And this is another area that we want to educate all of you on. Some bills look like they don't even apply. Let me get something real quick, and I'll give you a current example. In fact, I think Todd and I talked about this the other day. And it's... I want to get the right number on this. Yeah, AB 424, McCarthy. Possession of a firearm in a school zone. So this is one of those ones that splits our crowd because there's some people are like, well, I don't know if I want my gun in a school zone anyways. And it's not looking at something. Who wants to have a gun in a school zone five days a week? Okay, besides you, who, who at a younger level might want one? Okay? So all of you are thinking about yourselves, which is good. Nothing wrong with that. What about JROTC students? If this goes through, there is no junior ROTC program in California. That's the farm team for the ROTC programs at the university level, which is the farm team for the officer corps in all five branches of the military that make up our national security. That's how stupid and draconian Sacramento has become, that they would actually attempt to hurt national security by removing the right of JROTC kids to be able to practice air rifle sports on their high school campuses. But at face value, how many of us would know that just by reading the bill? And that's one of the reasons we're encouraging people to go to crpa.org, watch the webinars. I know some of them can be long because we have the attorneys and they want to point out everything, but that's good. 
Because when you know everything, then you don't fall for some of the, the false rhetoric. But that's an example of a bill, just like some of these cases, you might go, what does that have to do with California? Believe me, there are links. The other link to California, and you can think about this, the CRPA. We were founded in 1875. And I'll have Sarah give whoever can answer me one of the two reasons we came into existence in 1875, we'll get a free Chuck Michelle book. Very good, that was one, so she gets it. What was the other one? Okay, so in 1875, here's what went on in California. California did not throw the most troops to the Civil War, we didn't, but we had a high fatality rate because our boys weren't that good at shooting when they went off to war. So a lot of them didn't do so well on the battlefield. So the mayor of Oakland, that's right, I said the mayor of Oakland, became the first president of the California Rifle and Pistol Association, set up the first gun range in San Francisco. How things have changed in 142 years, okay? Um, but the other reason was because there was a little part of the state legislature that just created a new department called the Department of Fish and Game. California was the first state to do that. Every other state in the union bases their fish and game code off of ours. That is why when I stand in front of groups of people like yourselves and I say, California is the battleground. Anybody who thinks that they're gonna leave California and this isn't gonna follow them is lying to themselves. Because just take the bear bell. Most Californians like, oh, using dogs to chase bears. That's just not right. Number one, it was probably more humane than what's going on now. Number two, we have a bear population explosion. Number three, we have different types of deers like bucktail deer that may be extinct within like three years because of the number of bears that have grown in population that weren't even looked at. But it also went to 19 states the next year. And here was the argument Jennifer Fearing of the Humane Society United States made. California passed it. Your fishing game code is based off of theirs. Why wouldn't you? And legislatures across the country did it until it stopped because the good people in Maine said, well, that's just stupid. And they got a proposition together and overturned it. And now it's starting to roll back in some states. Hopefully we'll roll it back. But that's why you need to look at issues because this is why Bloomberg and Soros and their cronies put so much money into this state is because everybody else is looking at what we do here. And that's why we're not just fighting for the 38 million Californians, eight to 12 million of which own firearms. I usually go with the conservative number of eight million. We're fighting for everybody in the country because if we lose here, they will lose elsewhere. 